Hello, PDA supporters and fans. I'm Bill Bianchi here in Chicago, and I'm talking with Shama Sawant, uh, who ran in a 2012 election as a socialist candidate against the Speaker of the House in Washington State and did surprisingly well with very little financial support and not much media support. And here's some of the things that her campaign accomplished. Uh, she received 29% of the vote in a race against the uh, Speaker of the House, which was the strongest challenge he'd ever received. She had the highest vote for a socialist candidate in decades in Washington State, and the highest vote for any independent left candidate in the entire country in 2012. And then you also had some endorsements from unions, is that right? Uh, local Locals in the, in the Washington area, uh, communication worker. And you're currently running for the Seattle uh, City Council. Welcome. Uh, before we get started, maybe you could tell us just a little bit about yourself so that people could get to know you. Sure. I'm originally from India. And uh, in, uh, I live in Seattle. I'm a member of Socialist Alternative. Socialist Alternative is a uh, nationwide organization you know, of socialist activists. And a little, just a little bit about our history in terms of our activism. We were one of the forces that built for uh, the uh, anti-WTO protests in 1999, which were one of the you know, biggest The WTO. Wave. Yeah, uh, in Seattle. Okay. Right. Uh, you know, there was a huge wave. Siege of Seattle. Yeah, exactly. And um, following, immediately following that, we started uh, something called Youth Against War and Racism. And through that, we mobilized a number of high school students into walking out against not only taking a stand against war, but against military recruitment in, uh, in, on high school campuses. Mm -hmm. And our Seattle branch and our Minneapolis branch both were able to achieve the uh, most stringent restrictions against military recru recruitment on high school campuses in, uh, in all of the United States. So that's just a little bit of a background. Okay. And um, for myself, I'm, I'm, I teach economics at a community college in Seattle. And like you said, we ran uh, against uh, Frank Chop, uh, who's the Speaker of the House in Washington State. So he's sort of like our Mike Madigan here in, in Illinois, yes. who is also yes. the Speaker of the Illinois House and the most powerful politician. Is, yes, yes. Maybe in the world, as far as we're concerned, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, OK, well, let's talk about that campaign then. Uh, tell us a little about uh, the district that you ran in and the issues and the people, so that people can kind of get familiar with it. Yes. So uh, we ran in the 43rd district of Seattle, I mean of the state. So it's, it's a part of Seattle which is uh, not necessarily the, the most working class or uh, racially diverse neighborhood. You know, there are more working class and low income and racially diverse neighborhoods in Seattle. But the interesting thing about uh, the campaign platform that we developed was that there are so many issues that are uh, burning in the minds of the people in Seattle and nobody's addressing them. You know, nobody's addressing them all throughout the state. And if you look at the way uh, mainstream politics goes, usually in this country, you, you are, if you're a progressive or if you're on the left, you're told that, well, you, you know, because uh, there's this Republican Party threat that is always hanging over you, you don't want a right winger in any office. Mm -hmm. And so in order to ward off that threat, you have to accept the Democratic Party's agenda on whatever terms that they offer you. So okay. if you look at so if you look at the uh, politics of the Democratic Party, which is by far the most dominant force in all of Washington state, what they've really been offering all, all through these last several decades is, uh, you know, a very, very, uh, you know, tiny uh, crumb out of every social program that mm -hmm. is actually being decimated in large numbers. Okay. So we, uh, you know, we're familiar with these, these arguments too, but what did you do in your campaign that led you to uh, kind of break through some of the, you know, the media is not very, usually very uh, open to hearing arguments from uh, alternative parties. What did you do to break through and get your message out to, your, to the people in your district? Right. Well, one thing I should mention before I give you a ex uh, few examples of what we did was that uh, running, it's extremely important for uh, left candidates and for grassroots movements to run their own candidates now because you know we have to recognize this is a very changed period since uh, occupy uh, the dialogue has shifted a lot mm -hmm. and you know a lot of people tell me that uh, you know uh, now people are willing to talk about socialism which is absolutely correct actually if you look at opinion polls you know openness to socialist ideas and the you know the question of fighting back to you know win back what was taken away and so on has been gaining more credence but more so than that especially the younger generation is starting to identify that the system as a whole 
the capital system is not working for us. So if you look at our campaign platform, uh, the mo one of the most prominent things we, uh, we had on it was that this is an extremely wealthy state, and especially the district that we're running in is, is a wealthy district. And The district in Washington that you ran in is a fa fairly well, wealthy it's district. One of, well, it's not the wealthiest district, but, uh -huh. you know, uh, overall in the state we have uh, the, some of the most powerful corporations. You know, Washington is home to Boeing, Starbucks, Microsoft, Amazon.com. Chicago was the home. Of Boeing. You know, anyway, this who is not ended up voting for you? I mean, they, it's sometimes hard to figure that out. But who do you think uh, in your district, and how would you characterize the people who voted for you? But basically, people who are who identify themselves as progressives or on the left and are sick and tired of the Democrats not really uh -huh. doing anything useful. And if you look at our campaign platform, we, you know, we were calling for taxing the super wealthy and the big corporations in order to provide funding, full funding for public education, public transit. Uh, we were calling for a statewide single payer health care. We were, uh, uh, you know, we had a very strong statement against police brutality and racial profiling, which is a huge problem in the city of Seattle. And people would look at our program and say, oh, this is what, uh, what you would say as a socialist? I'm on board. I remember several people that I personally talked to who said, oh, if this is what socialists are talking about, maybe I need to look into this. Maybe I'm a socialist. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm curious, though, you know, there are other socialist groups who, who ran... Uh, Candidates, why do you think yours took off? Or, I mean, with similar statements, I'm sure they're making. They have similar camp. In fact, PDA's platform is is very similar in many ways. So, why do you think yours took off? I think, uh, well, first of all, there were certain uh, factors that sort of serendipitously came together for us. I mean, one of the factors was that there was no Republican running in the race. And so we were able to make a very clear uh, and bold argument that, look, you know, there is no case for lesser evilism here. Yeah, you know, okay. The, the, you, you have a case between a big evil, you know, the speaker who, is, who has presided for well over a decade over some of the most uh, ferocious cuts to social programs. And then you have us who are... Are, you know, we are activists, you know, we are grassroots uh, activists who are not career politicians and we are saying that, you know, this is what we want to fight for. And, and, and the main thing I'll tell you, which is different from uh, the way the Green Party, for example, runs its, uh, you know, its, uh, elect I mean, if you look at the Green Party's uh, campaign program, you know, for Jill Stein, which we, by the way, Socialist Alternative endorsed that, it's a very good program. It appeals to people. But I think the message that we take to people is that we don't promise that this one electoral campaign is going to shift everything dramatically. What we say is that, look, we're activists, and ultimately, this electoral space has to be occupied by mass movements and grassroots people, and this is something that we have to do together. And I think that is the most empowering message mm -hmm. that any electoral campaign can take to ordinary people. Okay. And that's, that's the main thing you need and to I do. And I want to get back to the connection between movements and electoral politics. Uh, in a little bit, but I still want, I want to ask uh, this question. Okay, that sounds good. You got 29% of the vote, but you didn't win. So why do you consider that this effort was a, su a success? I mean, if you look at, uh, if, if, you, if you say that uh, the only uh, measure of success or the only uh, way running a grassroots campaign on the left, independent of the Democratic Party, would be worth running is if you win, the first time, then that's like saying that, uh, that's like an engineer or an architect saying that I'm willing to build a skyscraper only if I can build this, the 10th floor today without building the foundations. And that's really something that nobody would, uh, you know, accept in right. physics or in that's other true. aspects of life. So our argument is why are you accepting that in politics? Mm -hmm. And in reality, what we're saying is that, uh, yes, it will be difficult, this road will be difficult, but it is absolutely uh, clear from the decades of history that the Democratic Party elite uh, have their agenda very clearly in the interests of corporations and the super wealthy. And as long as people in the left are going to see uh, working within the Democratic Party as the only avenue to actually make change, in reality, they're being held back forever. Mm -hmm. So for people who say that, oh, this is utopian, you can't really build an you know, independent left challenge, I would counter that by saying that it's utopian if you think that, is, that this is going to happen through the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. And in reality, there are lots of uh, well-meaning people within the Democratic Party, but if you look at what agenda gets carried out by the Democratic Party, not only at the federal level, but also at the level of the states, it is really the agenda of the Democratic Party elite. So in Chicago, I would say that, you know, the progressives in the D Democratic Party are not really getting their positions represented. Rahm Emanuel 
is running this city. Uh, Arne Duncan was running the city before that. So, so do you think your campaign succeeded in like opening up the dialogue, changing the dialogue? That Very greatly. I mean, and you know, and also, you know, in, in terms of why we ran this campaign also, you know, in, in, in partially in answer to your question, 2012, we knew coming out of Occupy was going to be uh, a year when movements were going to censor themselves, you know, go back home because, you know, well, let's just get the Democrats elected this time, then we'll talk about it. Bill McKibben, you know, who's fighting against Keystone also said this. So this is the, you know, usual refrain from the left that, well, you know, let's just get Obama elected, let's just get the Democrats elected, then we'll talk about it. We, we completely reject that idea. And so for us, uh, the question was, you know, coming into 2012, how do we engage politically with a wider group of people when their attention is squarely, uh, you know, in, in terms of electoral mm -hmm. campaigning? Well, run an electoral campaign yourself. Show what electoral politics can actually look like if grassroots okay. took over. And so that was, uh, you know, that was, uh, uh, that was the sort of the primary reason why we even uh, thought about electoral okay. campaigns, because we're not, we not politicians, we are, we are activists. But you're becoming politics. I, I mean, at least uh, electoral <laughs> people. Uh, I, I want to uh, work that idea a little bit about the lesser of two evils because that's something that's very important. And I can see where at the at the level you're working at, it's uh, it's not a very strong argument. But at the level of presidential politics, uh, when we f in fact, I think at your your website it does say something about. Uh, let's be honest. There's real differences between the Democrats and the Republicans, and I don't remember the exact phrases. But so there is, there seemed to be an acknowledgement that at the presidential level, it might have been necessary to vote for Obama. No, that, we, we we never said that. We we, we did not advocate voting. For I, Obama. I don't remember that you advocated, but you did. You do at you do clearly I, say I there, it that. would be naive to say there's no difference. Something along those. No, lines. No, I mean it would be it would be uh, simplistic uh, to say that there are no differences between the Republican and, and also the extreme sort of right wing that is now sort of determining most of the Republican agenda and the Democratic Party. Of course, there are differences, but the differences are in the rhetoric they choose to use. The differences are in the uh, pet constituencies they choose to build in order to build their support. I wouldn't say there's a difference in terms of the actual agenda that they want to carry out. Their actual agenda is very pro-corporate. It's a question of how they get at it. And in fact, I would argue that the Democratic Party is not, in many ways, if you look at the actual policy making, you know, if you look at the facts, they are not really the lesser evil, they are the more effective evil. Because if a Republican is in the White House, look how energized progressives are to fight against the war, uh, you know, the two wars, you know, to fight for, uh, undocumented migrants to find for, fight for citizenship rights. And then uh, Obama comes into power and suddenly all these movements pack up and go home. The wars are still going on. The largest number of deportations under him, Guantanamo based, is still here. And uh, look at the history beyond Obama. This is not just ab about Obama. If you look at uh, when NAFTA was passed, you, if you look at how uh, you know, NAFTA was passed under Clinton, and but it wasn't a program that came under Clinton. It was a very long, it was a pet dream of uh, the yeah. capitalist elite for decades, but they couldn't pass it under Republican leadership because the labor leadership was very defiantly against it. Okay. The moment Clinton comes to power, the labor uh, movement finds itself really impotent to fight it because, you know, wow, these are our people, right? So right. how can we fight it? And that's, I would say, is the real evil. Okay, uh, getting back to the, the campaign, what did the Democrat, your opposition, say to you? What was their response to your challenge? The Democratic Party? Yeah, in Washington and... <laughs> it, it, was, it, it's, it, was a, it was a tiny confirmation of that, you know, famous quote uh, that, you know, first they uh, laugh, ignore you, then they, they laugh, laugh at you, then they, they critique you, and then you win or something like right. that. So it was like that, you know, first, they, you know, they were inclined to ignore us, and the first uh, several uh, interactions I had, you know, in terms of debates with m my opponent, Frank Chop, you know, he was very, uh, very courteous, very polite and giving his canned answers, you know, well, we're, we're doing this, we're doing that, and, you know, it, you know, you have to take one day at a time, it doesn't work this way, that way, and so on. But if you look at the contrast, I mean, all these videos are up on uh, the internet for people to see, you know, if you look at the contrast between his 
a rhetoric that he used, you know, his language that he used in the first debate and the language that he used in the very last debate. In the last several debates, he started trying to appear as an activist. He started playing up his activist oh, really? credentials. He started talking okay. about how his mother had marched for civil rights. And, and our response was, of course, that is fantastic. We appreciate it. But what have you done in the last two decades yeah. for ordinary people yeah. other than cutting basic health, you know, severely cutting funding? The district that he represents, you know, his seat represents the 43rd. It houses the University of Washington in Seattle and Seattle Central Community College, which is where I teach. Both are major institutions, state institutions for uh, children that have nowhere else to go. Tuition has skyrocketed at both places. And that's happening all across the state. And what is their answer? Their answer is that, well, there's no money for education, but because we have to give yet another tax break to Boeing. And mm. what does Boeing do? Same you know, uh, Same yesterday, I think, I yesterday, think they got day, one here in Chicago, too. <laughs> yeah. And the day before yesterday, I think Boeing again announced that they're going to have another series of layoffs. This is what they do. They keep giving, giving away. Uh, you know, keep laying out the red carpet for corporations in the name of jobs, but actually we've lost jobs over the years. Mm -hmm. And so, the, the, and this is why I'm a socialist. You know, the, the thing is, yes, corporations will do whatever they want to do. They will take jobs wherever they want to take as, as long as they get cheap labor. If you accept their uh, logic, the answer is a race to the bottom in all states. We have to reject that logic entirely. And in every state, we need a grassroots movement. I would say what's unusual about our campaign last year is not that we got uh, such a uh, historic result. That what's unusual or what's problematic is that we didn't have campaigns like that everywhere in the country. That is what we need because people are waking up. People are angry, especially the younger generation. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for an alternative. One thing I'm really curious about your p campaign is how did you line up uh, some union support? Usually they are very leery of uh, uh, drifting away from the Democratic Party. Was it a personal relationships that you had or? No, not really. I mean, I think it, it, it's really, it's a question of their own assessment of uh, where things have been going. And, I, and just a very uh, specific example, one of the endorsements we got, which was in the primaries, was from the Amalgamated Transit Union. These are uh, 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 drivers and mechanics for uh, the metro system in, in Seattle. and. Uh, I personally, you know, as, as a candidate, I was invited by the rank and file at several of their membership meetings to represent our campaign. And they are in this situation where they are facing, ma they have been, it's, it's been a progression of massive cutbacks to funding to Metro. And there have been several series of layoffs. And again, uh, uh, now, very soon, next year, they're going to potentially face a big cutback in funding mm -hmm. because there's a, there's a regressive tax which is going to end. I mean, our problem is that it's regressive, but also that it's going to end. And so they're staring layoffs in the face very soon. And they're starting to see that the Democratic Party is not really working in our interest. But I also have to say that, you know, in terms of winning, uh, winning labor support and also, I would say, weaning labor away from the Democratic Party involves uh, organizing the rank and file, just like CORE did in CDU, because Frankly, um, many uh, you know m many uh, sectors of the labor leadership are still very tied to the Democratic Party, and I wouldn't say that uh, they really saw the value of this campaign. It was the rank and file that really uh, supported this campaign, okay. and the CWA again, you know, they communication workers, you know, they they are also uh, you know talking about the lack of jobs in IT and so on, mm -hmm. and so you know uh, it was attractive to them. Final question about the campaign. On a personal level, what was the most gratifying thing about that campaign for you? I think the most gratifying thing was uh, feeling uh, quite thoroughly vindicated, you know, by our result that the points that we are raising are not fringe points that it shows that times have changed. It shows really a watershed. You know, Occupy you know, itself might be in a lull right now, but it marked an end of a period of really dormant social movements. And now, you know, if you, if, uh, you know, if you'll, you'll see in the next few years, I think you will see much more of an energized political involvement from people. And I think this campaign was so. one of those, you know, seeds that we sowed. Great. Uh, well, let's move on to the, uh, the Seattle City Council campaign. Why are you uh, look, focusing on that? Why are you not continuing uh, to run for the state Senate or the state uh, representative? Well, we won't, we won't rule out running for the state house again, but 
the the fact is that because of uh, because last year's campaign was so you know got such a historic result and it was uh, so you know so phenomenal in terms of you know running as, as you said mm -hmm. on, a, on a on a very very tight budget and yet doing so well it clearly shows that there is a huge echo for the points we're raising and it, it uh, we thought that it would actually be a huge disservice to social movements and to the left in general to have such a historic win and then have it be like a flash in the pan and then wait for a next a state house run in, in an electoral fashion. Like, like I said, you know, we are not electoralists. We run electoral campaigns because uh, we, you know, it's one of the arenas where we have to build uh, the okay. you know build up the working class. And so and, and, and also I, I have to say that the city council campaign, uh, the city council races are much more engaged in by people in Seattle. So I think this uh, having this campaign behind us and having done so well and the fact that city council issues are actually very mm -hmm. you know active issues for people i think that does provide uh the left overall uh, a good place to you know really okay. uh, shift the debate to the now, left if you uh you may do well in this too but uh it, some people might say you'd have a better chance of winning if you ran as an independent rather than as a socialist what would you say to that well i'm, I'm not so sure actually first of all that they're right i mean it depends on what you mean by uh winning in the sense that uh, a lot of our uh, support, like I said, in last year's campaign came out of the fact that we are socialists. And in fact, I have to tell you, uh, you know, when you were listing the, uh, you know, the achievements or whatever, mm. the hallmarks of our campaign, another hallmark of our campaign was that when we went from the primaries to the general elections, we shift, we switched races within the district, which is, you know, which the state allows, state law allows you to do. But there is a certain you know, uh, meaningless, I would say even ludicrous bureaucratic discrepancy in the law, which said that because we were not in the race uh, in the primaries, which we switched to in the general elections, we were not allowed to put our uh, party name, socialist alternative on the ballot. We went to court for our right to say socialist on the ballot and we won it with, you know, uh, it was a very striking case, a court case hmm. that made the news. And what happened actually, you know, as opposed to running as an independent, I can tell you, that people were really uh, amazed and empowered by the fact that you know here we have this dynamic organization of uh, activists who are not only not hiding that they're socialists but they are demanding their right to call themselves socialists on the ballot and they won that right you know the, it, this has been mm -hmm. a uh, landmark state ruling in in you know in the state supreme uh, state court so you won that ruling we won that ruling let, let me ask and who do you expect to vote for you who will what groups again will vote for you uh, as a city council person i think who are you uh, trying to appeal to anyway well yeah well if you look at first of all if you look at uh the race divisions within seattle i mean there's at least 40 to 50 percent of the people who are uh and I, i'm making a conservative estimate who are disenfranchised in many ways you know if you look at how they are victimized in terms of police brutality and racial profiling. If you look at how low income they are, and if you look at uh, how much they are spending on rent, you know, skyrocketing rent is a major issue in this city. Mm -hmm. And so, if you, if our, our main campaign platform, you know, the main points are, we're calling for a minimum wage of fifteen dollars an hour. We're calling for a tax city, on, in the city. Yes, in the city. Okay. Uh, and there's a lot of precedent to that. Other cities have done that. Uh, and we're calling for a tax on millionaires in order to fund. Uh, education and uh, green jobs program. We're calling for a, a democratically elected civilian oversight committee that the police department the police will be department. answerable okay. to, not the you know not to the mayor's office. These are points that are going to resonate with a large majority of people because that's who lives in Seattle. Okay. Now I'm sure you support the Occupy right in in Seattle, right? But, uh, we not only supported, we we were very active in in within okay. Occupy. I personally, now, was active. My in Occupy. question is, do they support you? I know Occupy here in Chicago has been very hesitant to get involved in electoral politics, uh, and they, that may be a Chicago thing. I don't know. So, what's the situation in Seattle? Will they come out and vote and and campaign for you and vote for you? In Seattle, uh, uh, you know, many many people who were uh, involved in Occupy have supported our campaign either by helping us, uh, you know, leafleting and tabling and so on. But also, I, uh, you know, in my own neighborhood, you know, just as an interesting, uh, also historical fact about Occupy Seattle, 
we one of the historic things that we did within Occupy was we moved it from Westlake, which which was a spot where they were being you know we were being hounded by the police every night. We moved the encampment to the campus of my college, Seattle Central Community College, and we were able to play a central role in that you know in in coordination oh, wow. with other left okay. groups. Uh, and I was actually able to bring Occupy and, and my own union, my teachers' union, together to make mm -hmm. that happen. And they will come out and vote, you think? A lot of them, I, yeah, the reason I mentioned that was because I, I walk from my home to my college every single day, and I still run into people who say, hey, thanks for running, I voted for you. And I, they, are, they are people I remember from Occupy. From Occupy, okay. So uh, I think it differs. Like I, I want to say that another uh, person called Mike Lapointe, who ran for U.S. Congress, from District 2 in Washington State, in you know, it's a place called Everett. You know, it's it's a mm -hmm. little bit of distance from Seattle. He ran against a Democrat who uh, is a, you know who has got a lot of money from coal corporations and so on. He so he ran an anti-coal campaign. Mike himself, Michael Appoint himself, was a part of Occupy, and Occupy Everett endorsed him as a whole. Okay. So, so I think they it are differs. involved in it, Yeah, it, yeah it, maybe it just differs, a Chicago yeah. thing because the Democrats are so dominant Although I don't, here. I don't want to give you the impression that Occupy Seattle as a group endorsed us, but there were people up okay. within Occupy who Well, what would you say us? to people on the left uh, here in Chicago and elsewhere who are cynical about electoral politics? I would say that, look, if you're cynical about mainstream politics and if you, if you are completely frustrated and angry at how the Republicans and the Democrats have this debate where not a single issue or virtually not a single issue that concerns you as an ordinary person is discussed, then I am with you. I agree. But the solution to that cynicism is not to disengage from politics because disengagement only uh, ensures your own disenfranchisement. So the counter to that is to build our own movements and, uh, and, our, and out of those movements we have to run our own candidates. And, uh, and we have to recognize that if we want to actually bring about social change, which I, would, which I think progressives would agree is an absolutely urgent thing. You know, we need social and economic justice. The only way to do that is to build up the uh, grassroots movements and build up the working class such that they and we are able to occupy not only the streets, but also city hall and the state capitol and, you know, the White House. We need to o occupy mm -hmm. electoral space along with movements in order to really make social change. What's it going to take to win this election? Uh, it will take a uh, massive mobilization of volunteers. Okay. It will uh, take uh, a much more uh, uh, energized fundraising. I wouldn't say it's impossible, mm -hmm. but I would say that you know the good thing about pushing that limit would be that we actually are able to take this message of social change and socialism out to more people. The more the more aggressive we are in campaigning, the more tireless and dedicated we are That's in cool. campaigning, we will be able to attract more people, not only to this campaign, but to raising their sights of what is possible Let's in the future. Let's say you win. You'll, that, that's great. That'll be uh, you know that'll be everybody will be interested in reading. But but you'll be one person on the council, which will probably be filled with corporate Democrats and Republicans. And so, what do you think you can accomplish? Right. Well, the first thing I wanted to say is that you know, in terms of uh, you know, uh, if 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 we win, uh, we've already pledged that if if we win, we are going to take only the average salary of workers. I, I don't know if you know this, but Seattle City Council members uh, get a salary of around one hundred twenty thousand dollars which is second only to LA City Council in the mm -hmm. entire country. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're saying that how can these guys who are earning, you know, and people who are earning, their women too, who are earning uh, six-figure salaries have any connection with ordinary people. And, and it's true, there's a complete disconnect. So if we are elected to City Council, I agree, this, that, is, that is going to be a huge step forward. And at the same time, we cannot pretend that one seat is going to change anything. However, it will be a dramatic shift. I mean, think about it, right? If we win, there will be a socialist candidate winning the That's city council. True, very good. That itself will be hugely empowering to people. And we are going to use every space, every inch of space that we get as a city council member to uh, further the agenda of the working class, to use it as a bully pulpit, to push for issues. And the very fact that we will be pushing for those issues will energize mass movements. And also, you know, I'm sure many of your viewers will be thinking, well, that's true, but you know, that's very hard line. Aren't you going to compromise? Isn't compromise necessary? And I just wanted to address that because I know it ine inevitably comes up. Yes, compromise is necessary, but it depends on what your definition of compromise is. So if there is a bill, this is an example that I, I was using last year, that if there's a bill that increases funding for education by 30 percent, 
it's, I want full funding for education and I want corporations to be taxed for it. But funding, increasing funding for education is a good thing. And if that's the bill that the Democrats are going to push, then I am all for it and I will, I will help uh, push for it. But if their definition of, of compromise, which it really is, uh, is uh, to kowtow to corporations and real estate uh, conglomerates and say that, well, you know, we are going to give away this city to Paul Allen and you'll get a little bit of low-income housing in, in the uh, poor district, that's not our definition of compromise. So okay. we'll be fighting for our uh, people. On one of your videos, and I don't remember which one, or one it was, you said something about don't be shy. Don't be shy. Could you explain uh, what that means in the context of uh, uh, left political campaigns? I, I think I said, uh, you know, we need to be audacious. And maybe I said don't be shy. I, I don't remember that. But what I mean is that uh, the left is really holding itself back because of, you know, a combination of reasons. You know, it's been several decades of uh, demoralization, several decades of, you know, trying to get something going but not happening. And what I mean by that is we need to shake off the cobwebs. We are in a new period here. And yes, it's not going to change in one day, but if we don't recognize that now, we're going to lose a really important and historic opportunity and the right wing will start making gains. So we, you know, we not only have a, a, a really important opportunity, we have a duty. The left has a duty to ordinary people in the working class to, to take this movement forward in an audacious manner and in an energetic manner. Okay. We owe this to ordinary people. All right, very good. Um, let's talk about the big picture now. Uh, how does your campaign fit into you know, the bigger political picture that's occurring here in the United States and even globally? What, do you think there's some relationship? Absolutely. I think uh, the fact that times are changing enough for a socialist to win nearly 30% of the vote in Seattle, and this is in the United States, you know, this is, uh, I think you, would, you can call it the belly of the beast, you know, this is where capitalist power is at its strongest. And if you see change happening here, then it is important to, you know, notice that that's part of the sort of the domino effect that is happening all over the world. And I think uh, more than anything else, this is one of the most exciting things about being part of a movement today, because you can see that this is not a parochial thing. You know, it's not something that we are talking in Seattle. You know, we are, we are sitting here in Chicago. This is relevant for people in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Socialist Alternative is running a campaign for city council in Minneapolis, also in Boston also. So we are running three different campaigns. And Socialist Alternative is part of an international organization. And in South Africa, where we have one of our sister organizations, we have recently launched, along with the mine workers, uh, a workers and socialist party. We see the Egyptian revolution still unfolding. And in India, my home country, we recently had the first 48-hour general strike since the independence movement. This is a huge, this is a tectonic mm, shift so that is happening all over the and world. And you see yourself as part of that. We see ourselves as part of that. You mentioned uh, mass movements, and uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, what do you see as the relationship between the mass movements and uh, political action? Uh, often in this country, they're disconnected. Right, and, and that's a problem. I mean, you know, they shouldn't be disconnected. The, it's, it should be, in some ways, at least, I mean, uh, you know, one of the questions should be, you know, tactically, which is the best way to energize, uh, uh, you know, s social movements in general. Sometimes, like I said, you know, in 2012, running an electoral campaign was the best way for us to engage with people. But I would say that, you know, I would, I would take it one step further. I would say that let's look at examples elsewhere. I mean, if you look at, for example, how uh, Canada won its single-payer health care, you know, public health care. It was a combination of electoral campaigns that they ran, but those electoral campaigns mass came movement. from mass movement. Right. So you can't really, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a false dichotomy for us to say that we'll only engage in mass movements or we'll only engage in electoral campaigns. It doesn't happen that way. We have to have, uh, you know, phenomenal mass movements on the streets, but ultimately, how are we going to take power? in order to bring about, uh, you know, actual social change. You know, for a movement, it's not only about just going out on the street and making a statement that day and feeling great and then going back home to business as usual. No, that statement has to be in the service of making actual change, and that actual change then needs representation in well, office for, for, for those causes. Uh, what kind of uh, alternative parties do you see uh, emerging in, in the future? You think it's going to be a socialist party or a workers uh, labor party or maybe just a multi-party progressive group or 
What would you see happening uh, in this country? I mean, it, it, yeah, I, mean, I think there there will be there will be different uh, there will be different options that will be uh, put forward, you know, and there will be fists and bursts. You know, it's not going to be a straight line in the formation of the these kinds of uh, you know um, electoral formations. But what I see is uh, having. I think what is most likely is having a broad banner of a you know sort of a working class party mm -hmm. or a party for working people and youth or something like that, and I see that broad banner uh, having uh, independent currents within it which have uh, a lot in common and they're working together for it, but at the same time they have you know certain uh, key differences among them, but that doesn't that's not preventing them from working mm -hmm. together. So I don't see immediately on the horizon a socialist uh, you know banner emerging, but I do see a really, uh, um, uh, I, I do see in, in, in the future a, 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 a much, a, a, um, well, I, I would, uh, we would argue for a working class party, uh -huh. and our, defi would, our definition okay. of working class would be, uh, you know, basically, you know, everybody in, uh, you know, the poor, low income, middle class, everybody who's basically getting a shaft from the system. Okay, <laughs> that takes in a lot of people. Um, would your, let's assume that this uh, emergence of parties is taking, starting to take place, and would your party be willing to form a coalition with other socialist parties, uh, the Green Party, the Justice Party? Oh, uh, How absolutely. How would that take place? Absolutely, we, we, do, we do want to form uh, a coalition. In fact, even after we, uh, you know, in November, when we, got, when we got our, you know, general election results and we got 29%, we put out a call for uh, other left groups in Seattle to run with us on a slate, you know, slate of candidates, left slate of candidates that is independent of the Democrats. And the way we proposed that slate was that, well, you know, if Green Party can have its own independent uh, position, uh, and if any other party, any, any other socialist party wants to have its independent position, that's fine. But let's run a strong slate. Because, you know, imagine how much more powerful it would be if there wasn't just one left challenger in one seat, but if all the seats and the mayoral seat were being challenged by a slate of candidates, that would be so much more powerful. So we have, we have it's already... It's hard to imagine, although I must say. But well, you know, it's, it's just a question of time. I mean, yeah. you know, these things right. have happened in the past. And in terms of socialist, uh, the Freedom Socialist Party, FSP, endorsed our campaign. And uh, we have approached, uh, you know, different left groups to work with us. And in general, I would say that that's absolutely necessary. Okay, great. Sort of like what's happening in Greece with the Syriza party. Yes, I yes. And okay. we, are, we, are, yeah, no, yeah, we are playing a role within Syriza, yeah. Uh, and okay. although you know that wouldn't stop us from arguing what we think is the the, the yeah the correct position. Okay. Well, given the the crisis that the nation is facing, what do you see as the future of the two dominant parties? Uh, in terms and it's of it's a pretty big question, but <laughs> I mean, do you think the the you know, one or other of the the major parties are going to fade? People are saying the Republicans are done because they've moved too far to the right. Uh, the Democrats are often uh, betraying their base, and so. Uh, what do you see? Do you think they they should just continue as they are, or they will just continue as they are? Well, in terms of should, I I, not should, I think you know my answer will, about yeah. that. But whether they will or not, yeah, that's a very very interesting question that we have to uh, think about. I mean, if you look at the Republican Party, I, I agree. I mean, there's some sort of imploding that's sort of going on within the Republican Party, and there is some dysfunctionality, which they have they have you know, and this is this is something that we predicted as 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 Marxists that you know they sort of it's it's going to happen to many of these uh, you know what we would call bourgeois parties because uh, on the one hand they have to court their own constituencies in order to mm -hmm. build their own positions but at the same time when when it comes to addressing the sequester or addressing, addressing the deficit question the most sensible uh, position for them to have would be something that is going to anger their right wing base so that's one of the dilemmas uh, that they yeah that's again pull that they're going through uh, but you know the real answer to your question is is uh, I would put that to us, you know, the working class and ordinary people. What are we going to do? That factor is going to decide where the Republicans and the Democrats will go. Okay. Well, to wind up here, uh, and this has been an interesting conversation. Uh, you're here in Chicago, uh, speaking uh, Tuesday at the United Ec uh, Electrical Workers Hall, 37 South Ashland, and your message will be. Our message will be that. Uh, look, let's uh, let's see, let's open our eyes and see what uh, you know the writing on the wall that you know this is a huge door that is opened up for the left, and is absolutely critical for the left to come together and understand you know that uh, you know we need to build our own independent alternatives, 
we need to call for a mass working class party and we need to build social movements whatever they are wherever they are we have to be politically engaged and really uh, provide an answer for the burning questions that especially the youth of this country are seeing the youth are seeing you know, uh, a bleak future for themselves, correctly so, and we have to provide an answer to that. Okay. Uh, you're here in Chicago, which uh, some people call the epicenter of privatization, and particularly the epicenter for the attack on public education. Uh, what message do you have for the Chicago Teachers Union and everybody concerned with improving public education? Well, f the first thing I would say to the Chicago Teachers Union is bravo. What, what you did, uh, you know, in, in, uh, with CORE and with standing up to the Ram Manuel uh, you know, thuggery, you know, I, I think that was a phenomenal uh, achievement. Socialist Alternative was in solidarity with the Chicago Teachers Union struggle. And I think the way forward is pointed out by their own uh, actions. You know, the way forward is basically for the labor movement. I mean, this is absolutely critical. The labor movement has to make a clean break from the Democratic Party and build its own working class alternatives. That is absolutely the most urgent thing that the labor, movements ne labor movement needs to do. And that is the best way for the labor movement to really uh, empower itself right now mm -hmm. because if you look at especially young people and young workers they are disengaged from the labor movement precisely because they don't see the labor leadership doing anything useful they see it as a defunct uh, force and you know that's that's some that's the main thing we have to change and in terms of privatization of course you know the only way this is absolutely disastrous the privatization of social programs and education has been absolutely disastrous, but this is not a local phenomenon. The CTU is struggling with it, but this is not a Chicago phenomenon. This is a worldwide phenomenon. Everywhere, social programs and education and other social services are not only being privatized. And the, and the assets, public and assets. The ass and the public assets. They're being, you know, this is, this is basically a, a mass embezzlement by the ruling class of all these public assets that is being hap happening. And the only way to stop it is to launch a massive fight back. Mm -hmm. That is the only way to do it. We have to be. We have to be doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, good luck at your talk on Tuesday. Are you, are you speaking anywhere else between now and Tuesday? Yeah, we're we're speaking uh, tomorrow at uh, Springfield. Oh, that's and, right. And then okay. uh, Tuesday on, uh, in Chicago, and then after that, I'm going to New York City. Okay, great. Good talking with you. Thank you.